your boy Charles. Charles on there is worthy checking in. Hope you guys are having a good evening. We are getting ready to dove into another uh, book audio reaction. Let's go ahead and play it, and I'm gonna come back by reaction. Appreciate you guys. Suddenly, the Los Angeles Police Department became very interested in knowing who and what they were dealing with here. Born in 1967. In Umacao, Puerto Rico, of African and Hispanic ancestry, Rafael Perez had never known his father. His mother, Luce, moved her three children to Brooklyn in 1972 and quickly relocated to Patterson, New Jersey, where Rafael spent most of his childhood. The family moved again just before Rafael started high school, this time to a very tough neighborhood in North Philadelphia where they stayed in the home of an uncle who dealt drugs for a living. Despite his difficult background, Rafael Perez was a straight-arrow teenager who joined the Marine Corps immediately after high school. While stationed at the Marine Barracks in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, he met and married, at age 18, a young enlisted woman from the nearby Pease Air Force Base. Lori Charles was black and assumed, based upon his features and complexion, that Rafael was also. It was an early example of Perez's remarkable capacity for shape-shifting, especially along racial and ethnic lines. When his bride was discharged from the Air Force, her husband moved her to the Marine Air Corps Station in Tustin, California, Lori's home state. The couple broke up only three years into their marriage when Lori discovered Rafael's infidelity. In June of 1989, shortly after his wife had left him, 21-year-old Rafael Perez was accepted into the Los Angeles Police Academy. What made this remarkable was that Perez already had applied to and been rejected by several smaller police departments in Southern California after failing background and psychological tests. The LAPD, though, desperate to fill its ranks with black and brown officers, had let Perez slip through its increasingly loose screening process. Perez did his probationary stint in the LAPD's Harbor Division, then was transferred to patrol duty in Wilshire Division, where he first began to introduce himself as Ray. Driven and intense, Perez had a lithe body and a face that was remarkably handsome, except for eyebrows that grew in an almost solid line across the bridge of his nose. He advanced quickly within the LAPD, taking advantage of his fluency in Spanish to win an assignment as an undercover narcotics cop after only a year of patrol duty. The West Bureau buy team was made up of eight to ten younger officers who could convincingly pose as drug buyers in neighborhoods all over the city. While other members of the unit worked the beaches and busted Rastafarians, Ray Perez and David Mack accepted the most dangerous of duties purchasing narcotics almost exclusively in notorious gang neighborhoods and housing projects. Like most members of the Bai team, Perez loved the work. Just by its nature, there is constant danger, a constant go, 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 a constant rush, the detective who ran the Bai team, Bobby Lutz, would explain to the Los Angeles Times. Those guys were on the edge all the time. They lap it up. They relish it. Russell Poole, like a lot of LAPD officers in more mainstream positions, regarded undercover narcotics officers as freelancers who made their own rules and regularly became untethered from such niceties as due process and probable cause. The worst of them were the best examples of how the war on drugs had ravaged law enforcement in the United States. There was a distinctly ends-justify-the-means attitude that tended to blur the line between cops and criminals. Most undercover officers remained honest, but a lot didn't, believed Poole, who was convinced that both Ray Perez and David Mack had gone bad as members of the West Bureau buy team. During the first briefing I received on Mack, Poole recalled, I was told that he allegedly had been involved in several ripoffs of drug dealers, and since Perez was his partner, it seemed pretty likely that he had been involved also. In 1994, soon after David Mack left the buy team to transfer to West L.A., Ray Perez applied for a job with the Chino Police Department. Everyone who knew about this was astonished when Perez didn't land the position. Ray's boss, Bobby Lutz, figuring the yokels out in Chino should consider themselves lucky to land a top LAPD officer, phoned the smaller police department to ask what was going on. When the Chino cops said they couldn't talk about it, Lutz surmised that Perez had failed a test, either a polygraph or a psychological exam. 
It was yet another red flag that no one chose to wave, and only a few months later Ray Perez moved onward and upward to the Rampart Division's crash unit. Crash, which stood for Community Resources Against Street Hoodlums, was the LAPD's elite anti-gang unit, and Perez joined it at a time when the department estimated that Los Angeles was home to 403 distinct gangs, claiming nearly 60,000 members. In 1994, the year Perez joined Crash, gang members committed almost 11,000 crimes in the city, by the LAPD's accounting, including 408 homicides. Gang violence had become the number one problem in most citywide citizen polls, and about 10% of all Los Angeles' gang crimes were occurring in the LAPD's Rampart Division patrol area, turf of the notorious 18th Street Gang. In the mid-1990s, Rampart Division covered eight square miles of decaying apartment buildings and scabrous storefronts between Hollywood and downtown, encompassing the Pico, Union, and West Lake districts. These neighborhoods were the most densely populated in Los Angeles, and home to perhaps the highest percentage of illegal immigrants in the state. Vendors who peddled big sacks of oranges and dealers who sold small bags of cocaine worked the sidewalks side by side. Nannies and gardeners who sent half their minimum wage paychecks back across the border waited for buses all along the perimeter of MacArthur Park, which had become the largest open-air drug market in the United States and most of that drug trade was controlled by the 18th Street Gang. The 18th Streeters were by far the biggest gang in a city that had become the nation's capital of gang activity, claiming as many as 20,000 members who were scattered in subgroups, or cliques, up and down the West Coast from Tijuana to Portland, Oregon. The gang wove together layers of criminal enterprise that deployed a system of tax collection to link drug trafficking all the way from the powerful, prison-based Mexican mafia at the top to the small-time independent dealers at the bottom. More than 150 murders were linked to the 18th Street Gang between 1985 and 1995. Citizens all across the city, and especially in the neighborhoods most affected, wanted the gang dealt with and the members of Rampart's crash unit were on point in the LAPD's battle against the 18th Streeters, an engagement that would come to a climax in August of 1997, when the Los Angeles City Council won a court injunction against the gang that made it illegal for members to associate. In this context, joining Crash during the mid-1990s was more like becoming a special forces fighter in a wartime army than anything resembling traditional police work. Crash unit members were there to take back the streets, and an officer's performance was judged almost exclusively by how many gangsters he could put behind bars. Rampart's crash team had not only its own logo, the aces and eights of Wild Bill Hickok's dead man's hand, but even its own headquarters in a detective substation a mile from the main division station. We intimidate those who intimidate others, read the motto above the main entrance. Officers worked mostly at night and without any real supervision. If an officer made arrests that led to convictions, he was doing a good job. If not, he was considered to lack the initiative that anti-gang work required. Ray Perez had been a top producer as an undercover narcotics cop, and he continued to make a high number of arrests when he joined Rampart's crash unit. And perhaps no other detective on the LAPD could match his effectiveness as a witness in court. Public defender Tamar Toyster would recall her feeling of helplessness as she watched Perez testify against her client Javier Ovando in early 1997. Thumbs up button, guys. Thumbs up button. It was a case where Toyster figured that both judge and jury might feel a certain sympathy for her client. Perez and his partner, Nino Durden, had shot Ovando three times in the process of arresting him, and the 19-year-old was left paralyzed from the waist down. Ovando had to be wheeled into court on a gurney at his preliminary hearing and would be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. After Perez described how Ovando, whose gang nickname was Sniper, had attempted to ambush him and his partner with an assault rifle, though, the 18th Streeter's fate was sealed. Perez was unbelievably good on the witness stand, Toyster recalled. He was better than any police officer I've ever cross-examined. Smooth, sincere, articulate, with just the right amount of emotion. You couldn't bait him. 
You couldn't trip him up. You couldn't get him to react. Duly impressed, Judge, Judge. Stephen Schuliger sentenced Ovando to 23 years in state prison, even more time than the prosecutor had asked for. That was entirely due to how good Perez had been on the stand, Toyster recalled. I have to admit, I believed him myself. What's up, y'all? It's your boy Charles. Charles and Israel just checking in. Um, so what do y'all think about that book, man? Pretty interesting, huh? Crazy, man. Interesting story. Listen, go ahead and leave your comments and subscribe to Charles and Israel. Appreciate it.